Hi, I'm Dennis Weiss. Welcome to Our Town. We're at the Eisenhower Presidential Library Museum and Boyhood Home with Director Don Hammett. Hi. And, and good morning. Good morning. We have a little drizzly rain going on outside. Thank you, Lord, for anything that falls from the sky. That's Absolutely. Not we need some rain, don't we? Yeah, we sure do. So, a fitting, fitting start to what we're going to do today. We're, this is about your one year anniversary. The yes. symphony at sunset was your actual anniversary day, I think. But we're about one year in. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to talk about one year in Abilene, Kansas, serving as the director of the Eisenhower presidential facilities. Okay, don't okay? make me That's cry. That's what we're going to do. Don't make you cry. That's the only rule I have. <laughs> but as we look outside in this rain, so you came from Louisiana, which is not a dry place, no. <clears throat> to the first year here in Kansas has been pretty dry. That's what y'all tell me. Yeah, yeah. It's and warm. Y yeah. And cold. <laughs> Yeah, so I learned that 110 is really hot <laughs> and four is really cold. Yeah, that's good. I thought it would be really interesting for uh, viewers who watch us all the time to let them see and hear your perspective and we talk about stuff as we go through the next 25 minutes. So when you walked into the Eisenhower Presidential Library, we were running a camera uh, yes, a few days true. before your official start date, and so you got to meet us real quickly. Um, what, have, what has the impact on your life been here at this office and that chair doing this work? Golly, that's a big question it to is. leave now, I can off. just relax. <laughs> um, the responsibility of running an organization like this is vast of course, and um, I take my responsibility for the collection and the holdings very seriously. Um, and so while I am a joking person, I don't, I'm not joking about my responsibilities for caring for the stuff. Yeah. It's very serious to me. You know, we figured that out early on. <laughs> well, when I <laughs> wouldn't really let you did. touch stuff. <laughs> oh, I, I think it was the yardstick. <laughs> Whack! That did it, but no, it, it just comes across. It, it's. Um, human observation. This is a human interest program mm -hmm. with you. So it, I can see it on your face. Mm -hmm. I see uh, your eyes change, your demeanor changes, your focus on when we change a topic to yeah. touching something, to preserving something. That's a different side of you. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. the, the thought of caring for these things for our future generations is like the emotional, passionate part of my job. Mm -hmm. And I am not, yeah. I am not joking about it. Yeah. That's, well, that's cool. Because that's what part, big part of what you're doing here mm -hmm. is preserving the history for the future, and that is indeed a weighty task. It is. Yeah. It is, but it's one that I s just love. Yeah. Well, that's good because people who do things they love are mm -hmm. generally pretty darn that's good. That's what my at. daddy told me. Yeah, good for daddy. So, and you always have neat stuff. So the, we'll get Dave to take a picture later. Okay. But you have a new artifact over there in your office that you pointed out to me today. What is that? Um, this was a gift given from uh, Queen Elizabeth. To, to, to Eisenhower. It yeah. was a, a gift that she gave out for her coronation. 53, the date says. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's glorious. Yeah, it really is. And, and it's just a, a, a interesting example. We walk in here, it's in your office, but this facility is full of things with a story. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the story, and I ask you, so when did he get that and why? And, and we talked a little bit mm -hmm. about that. But if you look at that artifact as a part of history, there's, you made the comment, how does anyone get ready for a coronation? Somebody held, had to tell the potter to make that. Right, do you and do it? And that would have been months ahead. Years would, in advance? How do you I would do this? Think so, unless they just stock them, and <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know how this works. So, but for the people watching, we're, this place is full of things that can allow your mind to just go boom. Absolutely. And, and be interested in. And so the museum person in me thinks that that's the part that's the, the, the spark of imagination, the spark of an educational moment where uh, you're not just looking at an object, it's the context, it's the story, it's the people who touched it, it's the people who made yeah. it, it's what it was used for. Those are, the, those are the pieces of the story that I find fascinating. So you're right in the middle of presiding over the largest change to this campus in the history of the campus since it was built. What's that feel like? Well, you've, you've put it in words that are frightening. 
<laughs> I can't re-say them. It's on TV. No, it's um, it's it's a project that I've done before. So to create an exhibit of this magnitude is something that I have experience in. Um, and if you, I, I don't look at it the way you did. I looked at it. I look at it as a million little decisions. Okay. So it's a million little things to me. Um, and and slowly with making these decisions over time, we get to the end point. That's an interesting comment. Uh, I, as you have just pointed out to everybody, I see it exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. And that is my nature. I see all things from that end. That's the way I view things and I see things. So I, it's this big thing to me and then mm -hmm. I break it up into little pieces that require responsibility or not, but I still see the big thing first. It's what makes life fun for well, me. Well, and from the outside looking <clears throat> in, a museum exhibit is magic. It just it just appears. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful and, and, and exciting and interactive, and from the outside looking in, we perform magic. Yeah. From the inside looking out, we make a million decisions. Right. <laughs> and a lot of work, so, it is. you know, uh, Part of your one-year anniversary here is 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 and was the Symphony at Sunset, mm -hmm. of which you had a record crowd and a we fantastic did. event. We did. So you know, as my my question uh, in the context of our program today, so this is your second one, but that one was the record attendance. What does that mean for our community? What does that mean for this facility? And how do you feel about that? Um, you know, I was really, I paid it, well, I, I paid attention this year a little bit more because last year was a fog and a haze. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I heard a lot of people talking about they'd come in for the weekend. Um, and to me, that economic uh, impact on the community was important. These people mm -hmm. stayed in hotels, mm -hmm. um, bed and breakfasts, they ate at restaurants. Sure. Um, so I was really pleased that we had uh, uh, economic impact on the community. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. But we're already looking forward to next year. We're already um, making plans or, or trying to right. make plans uh, for an even bigger event because it's the 75th. It's the 75th anniversary of D-Day next year. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I was talking to my son uh, about Jack Ford, and you I don't think I've told you Jack Ford. Uh, Sam might remember Jack Ford. So we came to a D-Day celebration here a number of years ago now, and they had a Sherman tank on a truck sitting out here in your parking lot. And there was this elderly gentleman sitting in a lawn chair just sitting there looking at it. And I asked somebody, who is that? And I could just tell it was somebody, you know, who is that? He said, well, he, he was a Sherman driver in World War II. He lives in Wichita. <clears throat> so I went over and I could tell he had relative, younger person there kind of watching over him. So I introduced myself and Elizabeth, my wife, was filming. We were just getting some stuff. And, and uh, I said, um, I'm Dennis Sweet, work for Eagle Communications. said, yes, this, this is my grandpa, Jack Ford. Said he was a Sherman driver on D-Day, and I said, "Do you think he'd like to talk to us on camera?" And said, "Oh, I don't know. He's he never really talks about World War II, and this is, as far as I know, this is about the only thing he's ever been to, like this." So I just pulled up a chair and sat down next to him, started talking. We talked for a while, and then I asked him if we could get a little on camera, and we did. Um, but uh, his story was that he he was a three Sherman driver. The first one sank. Remember inflatable Shermans, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? They had the raft around them that wasn't wasn't really meant for the North Atlantic. Right. So, you know, his first one sank. And uh, when he got to shore, they put him in one that worked and got that one shot out from under him. And uh, he was in his third one, which had been shot, but it was still mobile. And uh, when he was relieved, uh, not relieved as in dismissed, but was given an opportunity to come home many months later. <clears throat> but he is he so he was a three Sherman driver and his story really was mm. something uh, He'd been a police chief in Wichita for a long time and it was just cool, right? You you'll that experience could not happen anywhere right, but right here Well, we're uh, just yesterday. We were talking about uh, looking for reenactor groups to come for for next year, so uh, You know, it's it's a, it's an ongoing planning uh, Situation for those events yeah. for those symphonies. They're massive Okay, we joked a little about the weather. So what do you think of living here in Abilene, Kansas, both Abilene and Kansas, 
and in the context of this task? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I've already told you and everyone else that, that the Kansans I've met have been genuinely warm and welcoming, and I'm not joking or mincing mm -hmm. my words, mm -hmm. genuinely warm and welcoming. So that's, that was a really beautiful thing to come here and have people reaching out to both, both uh, me and Rob to say, please come and you know, experience this or meet these people right. or whatever it was. So, mm -hmm. so you guys, y'all, included us intentionally, and that was lovely. Um, what Rob and I have been doing is going out into Kansas and going to different towns and experiencing different things. Uh, we haven't been everywhere because this state is large. It's big. It's a big state. Yeah. Um, but we've been to several places. Um, uh, we went to Lucas recently. We went to Cottonwood Falls. We went. Yeah. Both good trips. All kinds of places. I can't remember everywhere. Both good day trips from Abilene, Kansas. Absolutely. Right? We went to Alma and Wamigo and mm -hmm. I don't know. The list is ever growing. Yeah. Um, thanks to Julie Roller. She's, she tells us where to yep. go. She's a great mapper. She really is. She really gets connected. Doing a great job in our community. Absolutely. To make sure Abilene gets pushed up to the front of people that want to come here and stay here and come to the library and all those things. Mm -hmm. So uh, I saw you all, uh, and I, having been a horse trainer, you know, I used to go to a two-week national show or world championship show and come home and people would go, how was your vacation? And I would go, what vacation? I worked 20 hours a day for two weeks straight. So I, when these things go off, it's not, it's not your fun day. It's a entertaining day maybe for you, an mm -hmm. joyous day for you, but it's a big, culmination of work day for it you is. and your staff. And as I looked around that day, I, of course, I know who you all are. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw almost everybody and everybody looked like they were at full speed, dead on doing what they're supposed to do. And I thought, thank you, Lord, for the work that goes in to make something like this happen where we can see in the newspaper record attendance. Well, the thing is that we all love it. We all love that day. It's a lot of work and we're, you know, and we know that. But it's a it's a joyful day. We enjoy being there. Yeah. But and I made sure to walk around and say thanks to everybody. <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. So I have a sad one. Oh uh, no. You know, I look at this. This is my uh, like Dave and his camera there. My eyes go click, and I take pictures of things. So we didn't have nearly as many World War II vets stand up this mm -hmm. year. Did you notice that, Sam? Yeah. So. <clears throat> That's just a fact, right? Yet it is a fact. We can't change. Nope. But it makes it ever more important what you do for them now and what you're doing with these D-Day celebrations mm -hmm. and these joyous occasions. Absolutely. Because there were, were a few there and they mm -hmm. were darn glad to be there. Well, and this year through the National Archives, we are um, reaching out to our Vietnam veterans as well. So this is sort of a, a Vietnam year, if you mm -hmm. will within the National Archives. So we made sure to, to include them as well. So I'm sure you attended the Vietnam panel. I couldn't make it, it that was day. How was it? Fantastic. Okay, because that's part of your year here. Mm -hmm. That's an, a new, that was a new thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's just been done. Um, and I, not everybody could come. So tell us about it a little bit and how that was for you in your job and how it was mm -hmm. for you as a person? It was, it was incredibly moving, frankly. And the, the gentlemen that we had speak um, were veterans of, the, of that um, conflict and um, they spoke from the heart. Mm -hmm. um, we made sure to, to thank them um, institutionally for their services. And it, it, it felt, frankly, like a healing moment. Mm -hmm. And so I know we still have a long ways to go, but it felt, it felt cathartic. You know, so I, I watched, because we taped as much as we could, That's so right. I got to watch what we taped. Um, it was playing last it, night, too. It was, it was, it was impactful. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to see the faces of the different gentlemen, and I will emphasize there were different stories there. There were different stories. There were stories. different viewpoints there. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the, the secret to to preserving history is mm -hmm. to bring those things, those viewpoints into public view where Absolutely. people can hear, listen, make up their own mind. Right, and, and we feel that. like we can't um, allow us collectively to forget. We yeah. can't forget these things. We have to have them in museums, in archives. We have to be able to access them. So I've got a story for you. Um, it's always been said, you know, Vietnam was a different war, and it was, 
but it was probably just as much about technology, the camera, mm -hmm. um, as it was mm -hmm. about the difference in the war. Because for the first time, our country got to see everything. Instantaneously. Instantaneously. I think that drove outcomes, mm -hmm. right? So um, I was in high school, 17 when I graduated as a senior, and I'd made a plan uh, in the wintertime to go to upstate New York upon graduation, and my dear uncle Clayton Weiss at, at home there in Dove Creek, Colorado. I was telling Uncle Clayton I'm going to go to New York after I graduated, and he shook his head, and I said, what's the matter, Uncle Clayton? He says, New York. He says, why would you want to go to New York? I said, well, I'm going to go work for Uncle Jim and ride horses. He said, I don't like New York. And I said, why do you not like New York? And he said, well, he said, well, first of all, he and Uncle Tom, 10 months apart brothers, served in the same unit. Mm -hmm. So they went to basic training, landed in North Africa, North Africa, Sicily, mm -hmm. Italy, mm -hmm. and were in, headed to Germany when Hitler gave up the ghost. So that was constant combat all the way up. Very, very ugly, long period of time there. So he said they had loaded up to come home, were on a troop ship, very uncomfortable, crammed together, went over on the Queen Mary, came back on a troop ship, and he said they were pulling up to New York Harbor to unload, and the dock workers were on strike and wouldn't unload them. And so the captain came on and said, we have to go down the coast because we can't unload in New York. And he said there was quite an uprising on the boat. Uh, they were still fully combat armed, and, and the hue and cry from the soldiers was, just pull it up on the beach. We took the last one. We can take this one. <laughs> and to his dying day, I like that, that was his opinion. Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's always been a life lesson to mm -hmm. me. Mm, that's not welcoming the soldiers No, home it's not welcoming well, the whole right? Yep, so right. there, I think there's always been some of that. So let's, because this is a human interest day, mm -hmm. Let's say that we probably never treat those people who serve us, our warriors, as well as they deserve to be treated. And it's an opportunity for you and me and anybody else to choose differently. Well, I think it's also, uh, um, to me, it's also a matter of timeliness. Um, you know, so at that moment, this is how you feel at that moment. And then given some time, some distance, our attitudes change, collect, our collective memory changes as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of work going on right now in uh, public history on collective memory. Really? Yeah, it's fascinating actually. And so one of the things we're noticing in public history right now is our collective memory of women serving in World War II is absolutely different than the reality of women serving yeah. in World War II. Yeah. And so public historians right now are working on uh, preserving those stories and um, and in effect changing our, our collective memory on it. Don't you have a public program coming up on wax? Women um, Air Corps, women who flew planes at World oh, War II. Oh yeah, II? that's right. That's yeah. right. We do. Yeah. So the, one of our um, one of our museum uh, uh, curators, Jeff. You know Jeff. Yeah. This is one of Jeff's thrusts in his um, educational career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We say it all the time, every time the camera's pointed on us, but it, isn't it so interesting? You can pick any topic, and literally mm -hmm. we did today, really, your first year here, we're talking about what interests us and what interests you. The opportunity to preserve history creates an opportunity to shape the future. Absolutely. By enhancing the knowledge and conversation, mm -hmm. and you just talked about it, you call it collective memory. Mm -hmm. So that is that is the value that my son and other people's children will carry forward with Absolutely. them to be informed of, about their choices. Absolutely, and I, and you know some of the some of the new exhibits will reflect that change in collective memory that that additional scholarship mm -hmm. um, that we've had since the last exhibits were created. So fun fact, you probably have the world's second best collection of I Love Ike buttons by now, don't I'm, you? I, I need another one. <laughs> there's never enough, No, there's there? never enough. <laughs> so how many do you have? Not enough, Not man. Enough. I only have four or five. That's a recycle. I you know, I know. I, it was a hard choice this morning. Like, yeah. I don't have a new one to aggravate him with. Yeah, but. Uh, you know eBay. That's no, I go to the, lo the local um, antique stores. Really? Absolutely. I, oh, I shouldn't have told you that. No, you're oh, going to start buying them out from under me. I'll be in front of you hunting a Hawaii-like button. <laughs> yeah. 
So that's an interesting fact because you, you did. You have brought a whole series of buttons to this. I still have my little one here, but I'm pretty proud of it I'm, anyway. Yeah. I'm a little more obnoxious than you. Well, I wouldn't say obnoxious. I'd say visible. <laughs> but it's, it's what we do, mm -hmm. right? So I've had you... You told me one time here that it looks like a you know general we thing. Well, I've had other people because I wear this in other All the interviews time, yep. too. I just leave it there because I like it, so it's fun. But it's part of what we do. You know, I, I'm gonna get you some epaulets. Do that. Would you wear them? Oh, absolutely on TV. I would. <laughs> I'd probably not around town, but I'd probably wear them on TV. So I know we're down to a minute. Thank you for sharing a little bit about your first year here. And you didn't make me cry. Uh, not yet, got 30 seconds left. But thank you most for giving us a chance to have a first year here, Aww. for coming to Abilene to serve Dwight David Eisenhower and us. Here it comes. Yep, that's okay. We have <laughs> tissues under your leg there, we're well prepared. So the reality of it is, is thank you, thank you Rob. Thank you for coming here and, and showing uh, us you and um, and the dedication and the service to Dwight David Eisenhower. We sure oh, appreciate it, man. So sweet. Yeah, absolutely. So next time we'll have something on the table and we'll be back on and you'll have Samantha on. Kenner track. But today was great. Thank Enjoyed you. Enjoyed it greatly. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. I'm Dennis Sweets. I work for Eagle Communications. This is Don Hammett. She works for the Eisenhower Presidential Library, Museum, and Boyhood Home. We're wishing you a great day.